we're doing Lord of the Ringless, but uh, I was going to review what happened the previous week, if you weren't here. Uh, go back and catch up with it. Uh, you would have had to have been uh, in a hobbit hole the past decade or so to not know that there's this thing called Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> and the big tagline is, and one ring to rule them all. So, uh, some, some time when I was doing contentment and the subject of uh, singleness came up, I put together the two and we have Lord of the Ringless. And what you want is one desire to kind of encompass and rule all your other desires. And that desire is all about doing God's will. If you do that, everything falls into place and you live happily ever after. If you don't do that, you don't live happily ever after. So last week we uh, did a part one on contentment. This week's part two of contentment, but they're actually two different series, so you have the benefit of both if you want to go back onto truthbase.net to find more. And we are supposed to wait for the fulfillment of God's promises and the revelation of his character. I wait for the Lord, and in his word, I hope, not my desires, not what my society thinks, not what ex-roommates think, I hope in his word. What God has revealed is the thing in which I put my hope, and then I will never be disappointed. And while we're waiting, God waiting is waiting. He's waiting to be gracious to us. He waits on high, to, you'll find the passage. Uh, to be gracious according to his perfect, that means there's nothing better, timetable. And uh, the, the mantra is, God gives what's best when it's best. When it's best. He knows we don't. That's why they made him God. Actually, he was God before we were made. Uh, no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. That's something that I have in my control. That's what I should focus on while I'm waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises. And God's goal is not just to give me stuff. God's goal is to give me a relationship with him. That's what I'm gonna spend eternity doing. And that's why we need to focus on the giver rather than just the gift. New Testament take on that is abiding in Christ and then you bear fruit. Last week we looked at some of the reasons why we have difficulty waiting and why we doubt the promises of God. And it's this nasty little thing called sin. That is sons and daughters of Adam, we are infected with lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those are the things that kind of Satan uses to mess us up. We looked a little bit at Saul's life and saw that failure to wait brings disaster. You don't get the blessings. Of, I made allusion to Israel demanding that God give them meat in the wilderness. He said, meat, I can do meat, no problem. You want meat? Here's meat. So much that they choked on it. And uh, then he sends leanness to their soul. So it's a good idea to wait because God knows what's best when it's best. Looked a little bit about how to profitably wait and has a little acrostic and the biggie is your will is surrendered while you prayerfully wait for God's perfect will. All right, again, perfect is perfect. So you can go back and look at the uh, aspects of that. And then you continue to trust him until the end. You don't like, you know, it's like a guy running a race. You get to the finish line and say, oh, well, I'm just tired and quit. Or I'll just give up and take a shortcut. You know, when you're almost there. You never know exactly where the line is. You don't, never know exactly God's timing by design because he wants you to trust in him. So that is what we wait for. And that should bring us to Lord of the Ringless, the passage on that you should all be familiar with as a single kind of person is 1 Corinthians 7. And uh, I'll be referencing it later on. Uh, but I want to deal with the subject of contentment first, and then we'll get to singleness somewhere down the road. Appropriate to be doing this on Valentine's Day, or day after Valentine's Day, because that creates a lot of discontent. Uh, if you really want to be discontent, move to Spain. Chad was telling me when they were in Barcelona, they found out that they don't celebrate Valentine's Day, they celebrate St. George's Day somewhere in April, March, April. 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 And uh, what they do is uh, the guys give gals a rose, a rose. I mean, the florist union just didn't get their act together. I mean, <laughs> they could have sold dozens and dozens and dozens. We were at Costco on Valentine's Day. All the guys are walking out with you know, $50 bouquets of roses. And then you see some women walking out with $50 bouquets of roses. And they're there trying to figure out which one did they like better so they can give it to their husband to give to them. But that's what love is all about. But in Spain, you just get one rose. And the women give guys 
a book. <laughs> like, a book? <laughs> and Chad was lamenting the fact that there's nothing about chocolate. I mean, <laughs> no wonder the population growth has slowed in Spain. <laughs> I mean, books versus chocolate? Yeah, one right. That's, that's sad. All right, so <laughs> there's all kinds of fun stuff you can read about Valentine's Day. Uh, I usually peruse the stuff. And this year I was really happy to find that there is a lot more research being done into the subject of love and romance. And I don't mean sociological research, I mean brain scan research, the stuff that's like for real. Some sociological stuff you always have to kind of figure out, okay, where, where, where's their sample, what are they studying, where are they getting the information, what's their bias, what they're trying to get through. But brain scans don't lie. And uh, they discovered some interesting stuff about brain scans and people that I might be able to work into the sermon later, even though it's totally unrelated. No, <laughs> it's not unrelated. It will be definitely part of next week when I talk about Song of Solomon. So in the original uh, series, there were two part series. Uh, this Lord of the Ringless is part two. And in part one, uh, Roman num part one, Roman number one and two, we looked at the sources of discontentment and if you go online, I'll actually pick up a few of those down below. It's unsanctified desires and our old adversary, the devil, Satan. Uh, those are sources of discontent. And uh, if desires are unsanctified, you will wind up being discontent. There's also a sermon that I did back in 1993. That was a long time ago. And I entitled it, Initiated into the Secret Mysteries of Contentment. Ooh, sounds like it's gonna be good. Uh, unfortunately, there's no audio for it, but there is an outline and I've got some quotes down from it. But this concept of initiated comes out of Philippians 4.12. And this is where Paul says, you know, I, I, I know what it's like to have little, I know what it's like to have a lot. I have learned the secret. I've been instructed, some of it. but th it's actually, the only time this word is used in scripture, it's used of uh, the mystery religions. And uh, back in the day of the New Testament, they had a lot of these things going around, all of them were demonic. Actually, all of the ancient Near East had these mystery religions and people needed to be initiated into them. And we have some secret societies today, but the, each one had their own secrets and you couldn't get it unless you kind of committed to being part of it. And Eventually, uh, if you dig through archaeological stuff, you can find some of the content of these mysteries and what the stuff was. And it kind of boils down to um, a perspective on life as well as some things that you do in life. And the perspective is key, particularly if you want to be content. It's really a matter of perspective. If you just look at the present and say, this is all there is, I don't like it, I'm discontent, yeah, the balance with discontent. But Paul had deprivation, but joy. Those of you who've been through the book of Philippians kind of know it mentions joy more than any other book, you know, per verse or chapter. And the, the secret of joy is also the secret of contentment. And for those of you who haven't studied it or don't recall it, there's a key idea in each chapter that you might want to remember. Paul said in chapter one, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the basic perspective of, I want Christ more than anything else. If that is the desire of your heart, you are well on your way to permanent contentment. You have him, you have him forever. What more do you need? Chapter two, um, the thing that is kind of a, a key thing there is we should have the same mind that Christ had. And that is you serve others to please God, so he'll please you. So Jesus humbled himself, Death on the cross, therefore God exalted him, name above all names, and uh, we're supposed to follow that model. Chapter three has this piece that uh, doesn't sell well in our society. Paul says, I want to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. I mean, nobody sells Jesus like, hey, come to Christ and enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. You know, it's like, no, I want my life to be happy. That is the way to be happy. The road to glory is through the road marked suffering. And uh, he said everyone who is mature should have that same mindset as they basically uh, identify with Christ, follow his methodology of interacting with others for their benefit, not his, 
and then it winds up good at the end. And everyone who's mature should have that same mindset. Then you get to chapter four, and the actual secret to contentment. Do I have the secret? Yeah, so it's going to be here. It's actually verse 13. It's also 2 Corinthians 9. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We can live in abundance. We can live in deprivation. We can live uh, in any circumstance through Christ who strengthens us to do so. How does he strengthen us? Through his grace. What do you have to do to get his grace? Humble yourself under his mighty hand. A uh, 5th century BC uh, Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, or Lao Tzu, um, something along those lines, the pronunciation changes. He was a contemporary of uh, Confucius around that time. He says, there's no calamity greater than lavish desires. There is no greater guilt than discontentment. Um, there's much to be learned by finding quotes and thinking about them. There's no greater guilt than discontentment. Guilt, that means you're doing something that's wrong, and that wrongness comes from being discontent. That means I'm dissatisfied with my lot, I'm basically rebelling against God because I don't like the way he has ordered my life, and therefore I incur a guilt. Hmm, that's not good. And there is no greater disaster than greed. I want it, I want it. The word for greed, more, I want it, I need it. Um, another gentleman that some of you have heard of from another tradition, uh, Buddha, said, of all the worldly passions, lust is the most intense. All other worldly passions seem to follow in its train. You have this desire, and this desire drives you to do things that are basically gonna cause disaster in your life. Just as a tree, though cut down, can grow again and again if its roots are undamaged and strong, in the same way the roots of craving, if they are not wholly, completely uprooted, sorrows will come again and again. And this uh, kind of thinking is the basis of the series I did on deadly desires. If you do not change your desires, which are a reflection of your values, so if you do not change your values, the desires will spring back again and again and cause grief repeatedly. Even when you have what you want, you will be unhappy. Reality check. Are all married couples blissfully happy? No. Do most singles entering into the estate think, that's state of marriage, think that it, they're going to be happy? Yes. So where's the disconnect? piece of research I came across a number of years ago was uh, you know, half and half divorce. That number has declined since uh, the 70s. Equaled, uh, much of divorces equal the rates of marriage. And then of the people who managed to stay married for 20 years, only six out of 100 said they're really happy. And there's a little higher percentage who said they're happy. But that's like, wow, why would I enter into this thing that my odds of being happy in it are miserable. I mean, <laughs> nobody, lottery ticket buyers, yeah, they do, um, you know, basically go for, oh yeah, those odds, six out of 100, 6% chance, actually a little better than the lottery, um, but it's, it's gonna cause sorrow if you don't do it right. So I want to go down to the contentment, and give us a little thinking on it. So, uh, contentment is having all you want or could desire. Good one or bad one? Nah. <laughs> yeah, because once you have all you want and you desire, you actually run out of purpose for life. You know, we are made actually to quest after something. And if you take away a person's uh, opportunities to do something, they just kind of shrivel up and die. How about desiring nothing more than what you have? That's not bad, but what if God wants you to give you something different? Like, you know, rocks with a little bit of moss on them? They have all they want. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> you might want something more. Um, God might want to give you something more. So, this is actually not a bad concept. Uh, remember the series I did on Psalm 1? 
uh, on synthetic happiness. That's supposed to say someone. I don't know why my pen's acting up. Uh, but you can make happiness if you, and if, if you realize the situation doesn't change. But as followers of Christ, we are constantly being changed. Having no unmet needs or desires, that's again, like, I'm, so I have no desires, I have no, I mean, what do I do with myself? Being satisfied with what you have, that's the flip side of the uh, desiring nothing more than what you have. Uh, this one's not bad. Freedom from covetousness and love of money. The Tenth Commandment, the one that, you know, we kind of, you, you never accuse anybody of, that, of breaking that one. You know, it's, <laughs> oh, you're coveting. Well, maybe, you know, around, if there are four people around, three pieces of cake. Yeah, okay, then it can get nasty. <laughs> but um, freedom from covetousness and freedom from the love of money. Paul said in, to Timothy that those are good things to be free from. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You wonder from that, you experience grief, just like uh, Buddha said. Uh, having what you need to experience a sense of well-being. And I think that actually gives some insight into um, this concept of experience, a sense of well-being. Because our sense of well-being is culturally determined. You know, if uh, everyone around you has one shoe and you have two shoes, you feel pretty good. You're doing well in your souls. Uh, all right, so, sorry about that. Yeah, I'll try to behave. <laughs> uh, but if everyone around you has, you know, two pairs of shoes and you only have one pair of shoes, you're discontent. We, we compare ourselves to others and we draw our sense of contentment versus, oh, well, they have something that I don't have. Well, that's what covetousness is all about. Don't go there. Uh, God, if you're doing following God, he gives you all you need to do his will. And uh, then your perception of what's necessary for your well-being is, hey, God has already given it to me. Or if I needed it, he would provide it. Uh, this one, I think, is, is reflected in Paul in Philippians 4.12. Being independent upon outside circumstances for inner peace. Uh, it's not like you know, Kung Fu Panda 2. He's on his quest for inner peace because he, he can't really function without this inner peace. And that's actually true of a lot of people. There's so much churning going on inside them that we function at such a lower rate of efficiency and then life doesn't go as well as it should because we lack inner peace. If we're always saying, oh, I need this. God, how are we doing this? It's actually like Abraham nagging God in Genesis, so probably even 12 to wherever, 20, he gets Isaac. Every time he shows up, God's there saying, oh, look at the land that I gave you that I promised you. Isn't it great? Where's my son? You know, he, he's always saying, I'm always on. You know, it's like, God will give his son when it's right. And then God actually gives him a son. And God says, okay, give him back. You know, and then Abraham had to really learn the secret of contentment. When 22, he had to realize, oh, God wants me to sacrifice Isaac, but he's going to give me kids through Isaac. I'll give him back and he'll resurrect him, which is a really, really cool reasoning. Uh, peace, this little guy, inner peace, is a cessation of hostilities or conflicts from without and within. If you realize God is bigger than the boogeyman, he can take care of your enemies, and God can even take care of the enemy within your soul that wars against it, your lust and desires, and give you peace. That's really what you want. Um, you know, just having an other, if, if a carnal person then gets married to an other carnal person, and you have two carnal person, you've just multiplied the misery. You know, um, it's like, you know, joy shared is doubled, but misery shared is quadrupled. It just gets worse and worse. And then you had kids that, you know, basically have two carnal parents are gonna raise carnal kids. You got a house full of these people. It's like, life was better when I was single than it is now, uh, which is one of the reasons I never wanted to get married uh, until God changed my thinking. Actually, so Jill came along, but. Bill, would you say the last one is the best definition then, the being? Being independent upon yeah, outside circumstances. Yeah, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, you have love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, you know, self-control, whatever, all those fruits of the Spirit, and then the salad of the Spirit, and you know, all those other great things that the Spirit provides. Sources of content, um, briefly, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on these, but this one I think is kind of key. God said, you know, he will supply all our need, Philippians 4.19 through Paul, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, but we have desires and then our desires become our needs. I gotta have it, I gotta have it, I gotta have it, I gotta have it. 
No, the only thing you gotta have is God. And that's all you really need. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, food, clothing, it doesn't mention anything about designer stuff, be content. Nothing about a place to live, nothing about even a job, or you know, a mate, or a house, or any of that stuff. It's just, you can be content in him alone. We sing it, Christ alone. And that is really what it's supposed to be. So we focus on our desires so much that we think that they are needs, and then we say, oh, God is a liar because he hasn't given me what I need to be happy. Just think about how that sounds. You know, you want to stand before God and say, God, you didn't give me what I needed to be happy. So you're a liar. I don't think we're going to want to say that at the judgment seat, but we actually kind of say it now when we are discontent with what God has provided. We get that from you know, comparison to others. Um, we also get it from greed, it's desire for more. So I, I got it, but you know, it's, it tastes good, but I want more and more, and that's how we get sick. We just stuff ourselves with things that are not good for us. Uh, covetousness is a form of comparison. Someone else has it, I want it. Envy, I, I don't want them to have it. Uh, a lot of this stems from poor self-esteem or insecurity. Uh, one of the horrible things that happened in, I, I switched uh, grade schools when I was uh, fifth grade and I kind of walked into the grade school in the middle of the semester. You know, it was, you know, it's like, you know, it was culture shock and it was a number of things that uh, happened. And uh, then they had this thing called Valentine's Day. You know, so it showed up in February. And I, I didn't really know how the thing worked and people give others Valentine's Day cards. And the thing was, well, is anybody, am I gonna get a Valentine's Day card? And you know, fortunately there were the people whose mother said, you have to give everyone a Valentine's Day card. And then we found that everyone got a Valentine's Day card. It was meaningless because you wanted to be special. You know, so you know, it was just so for the next three or four years it was miserable. And then I went to an all boys school. Yes. And I mean I have to deal with that stuff. Although I don't know what's going on there now. <laughs> but uh, we basically a source of our discontent is I need to have something else to make myself feel significant. You know, it's like I have to have the latest of this or the prettiest of that or the most cool thing according to this article I read in this online blog. You know, it it it's causes discontent with what God has provided. Uh, unless I forget the old Satan's old favorites of lust and love and money. Which brings us to our guy, Satan. Live and well on planet Earth, walking about seeking whom he may devour. Those of you who don't believe in Satan, I ask you this question. Where do we get our information about the spiritual realm? You look at it from your spiritual eyes and say, I haven't seen the guy with the you know, pitchfork and the horns and you know, the, the long tail. Where do we get? It's only what God has revealed. And God has revealed that we have an adversary. Peter said, your adversary, the devil. And he basically showed up in the garden and he's been causing mischief ever since. He manipulates our God-given desires for power, pleasure, and possessions. All three of those guys. And the idea of security and significance play out particularly in the idea of a mate. Um, you know, you, you, there's some people uh, yeah, gals, okay, this is a stereotypical comment, don't accuse me of chauvinism, but it, based on the surveys that I read about our culture, gals are pretty much driven towards security when it comes to relationships. Uh, for dating, they want someone who's fun, but for marriage, they want someone who's going to take care of them in the long haul because they're going to have kids and you know, they're going to need some protection, at least some finances. Uh, guys tend to look more for significance, the kind of idea of a trophy wife they kind of want. Uh, their worth and value comes from who they marry. And both guys and gals are, uh, you know, they have both power issues on these two. When you get a couple married and they start fighting, the power issue comes out. Chris pleasure and possessions also fit in. So all these things cause people to be discontent with their lot in life. Which brings us to the proper starting point for this sermon, which is Roman numeral three. So all that stuff was in Roman numeral one, I mean the first half of this thing, Lord of the Rings. Okay, how to have what you want and want what you have. I actually saw a title of that in a book a number of decades ago. That's, a, that's pretty good. Um, this is the piece that I think we have issues with, to want what we have. Um, how to have what you want, goal setting, waiting on God, praying, trusting, 
stuff I talked about last week. Um, and then the second part is uh, how to actually want what you have. That's the synthetic happiness that we've talked about in the past. And we got brain scans to show that that stuff actually works. So the basic mantra for this point is you change for the best. So you know, change gets you more of what you want. And then you trust God for the rest of the stuff that you don't have what you want yet. So contentment is found in submitting your present path submitting to your present path as God's perfect will. So if we went to James, we don't have time there, he talks about you lust and have, and um, you lust and you don't have, and you have, and then you don't like it, you know, our society. So that's James 4, verses uh, 2 to 5, really. And then 6 gets to the corrective and says, submit yourself to God. So this does not say um, that you just take your present path and say, oh, this is what God wants. I, I was born a sinner. Uh, I come from a long line of sinners. I, I sin and I shall continue to sin and I'll just be content with that. No, 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 because that's not God's will. God's will is your sanctification. A little study, this is actually, could make a whole sermon right here. Deuteronomy 5.21 is uh, the last of the Ten Commandments and the second giving of them before Moses uh, died. And the nation went in to actually possess the land for real. And it says, don't covet, don't desire stuff, particularly what your neighbor has. And then it says in Ephesians 5.5, 5, do you know that covetous people who are idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of God? So not only are you going to be discontent in this life, you're going to be discontent in the next life when you lose out on the inheritance God has in store for you. And then Colossians 3.5 says, put to death the earthly part of you, what remains of your earthly members, the non-spiritual side, the unsanctified desires, and list covetousness as something to put to death. So that's an other sermon, but meditating on those, realize God commanded it as one of the big ten. I lose my inheritance by disobeying that command, and I have a explicit command to get rid of it, and you get rid of covetousness by trusting God and changing in the areas where you need to. Uh, we might need to change our current path of action uh, to do what God wants us to do to get on the right path. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, this is how you get rid of those unsanctified desires that cause you to be discontent. You compare them to God's word, and the thing that should be flowing through your thinking is God gives what's best when it's best. No good thing will he withhold from them and walk uprightly. For to me, Lewis Christ dies gain. The scriptural viewpoint on contentment should be dominating our thinking. It doesn't dominate your thinking if you don't know about it. You don't know about it if you don't study it. And memorizing it is also a great way to do that, but a lot of people memorize stuff and they don't understand what it means. So uh, do both study and you almost automatically memorize it and keep reviewing it. It flows through your thinking and you start developing the right set of values. And then we must draw on God's grace to prayerfully change, thankfully wait, and joyfully endure. Remember this thing called this some suffering involved in this process? Um, we trust God for bringing about the fulfillment of his uh, promises in the perfect timing. Uh, most of you know that grace is the coin of the realm of heaven. It's the power and desire to do God's will and experience his favor. Out of Philippians 2.14 is a spot where you can go find that. Any questions on that one? So change where you can. Trust God for the best. I'm going to be advocating some changes specifically uh, in a few minutes. Knowing God and his promises is the key to contentment. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have everything I need to do his will. God is able to make his grace abound. We, we sung it. It's 2 Corinthians 9. So that we having all things that all we need can abound every good work. So God provides everything we need. And if his will is to wait, then God gives us the grace to wait. If his will is to do something, God gives us what we need to know to know that it's time to do something. Some people just have a desire. So I have this desire, therefore, you know, God wants me to do it. No, no, you cannot run your life on your desires that are unsanctified. Next week I'm going to be talking about the Song of Solomon and how to not wake in love until it pleases. I'll allude to that a little bit near, and we'll talk more about killing desires then. But uh, some of the things you need to know about God to help you 
experience his blessings is he is sovereignly and wisely in control. Okay, God is sovereign. He's in, in control. He knows what he's doing. Apply that this way. God has arranged all my circumstances for my best benefit in his glory. This is the piece that we sometimes leave off. We say, oh, well, if I were in charge, I would do things this way. And God says, thank you very much for your input. We'll take it into consideration. <laughs> so you all know, you don't have enough prayer getting that answered. But the, the piece that we need to throw in there is we are on this planet for God's glory. We are on this planet to serve the Lord. And that needs to enter into our thinking. And if the only thing that enters into our thinking are my needs, my appetites, my desires, my worth, and my value, we're going to be a disaster. You can find that in not just Christianity and Judaism, but almost every other religion would tell you the quest for desire causes most of man's problems here on this planet. Those guys observed it. God gives it from the blueprints that he used to create us. Second thing we need to have as a bedrock of our thinking for contentment is God is infinitely good and loving. Loving means he does what's in my best interest. Infinitely good. He will always do what's in my best interest. You can throw power in there, you know, as, I'm, as omnipotent, if you want to do a theological term. He'll give me what's best when it's best. And when it's best is when God thinks I'm ready for it. Or when God knows I'm ready for it. Hmm. Ah, I'm ready. <laughs> there. When you're ready. So it's not when I think I'm ready. Okay, God, I'm ready. You know, it's like, no, you, you, don't, you don't have any of the pieces that you need. You don't have any of the character developed. Uh, you're not ready to contain the things I want to give to you and he will know what's best. So when I was a you know, young guy, I was once, way back when, I know it was like in a previous century, um, there was this little gold pocket knife and uh, it belonged to my grandfather on my father's side and I saw it in my dad's drawer and I wanted it and he said, I'll give it to you, you know, a little later because he kind of knew that I was a young kid and wasn't really ready for, you know, playing with knives, much less one that was gold. And uh, then a number of years later, I actually graduated from college and uh, I was on a sales call with my boss and he picked up this little thing outside the ground and it was, the knife had fallen out of my pocket or something, wherever it was. <laughs> I said, wait, that's mine. He said, prove it. He said, he told him the initials on it. He said, oh, okay. Um, and you know, I probably wasn't even ready for it then. Now I don't even know where it is, but I, I want to pass it on someday. <laughs> but had he given it to me when I was really young, I probably would have stabbed my sister with it in self-defense, of course. <laughs> and you know, I, I'm sure I would have gotten off, or at least you know, involuntary manslaughter or sister slaughter. Um, but God is like a perfect parent. He doesn't give us razor blades to play with when we're young, all right? He, he doesn't give us what's best when it's not best. He gives it when he knows that we're ready for it. So I can trust. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. I can trust that that's gonna happen. God's gotta prepare me, he's gotta prepare my future spouse, if that's in his, uh, I was gonna say in the cards, but it's a little too tarity for us. But that's in the future plan, since his, his ball he goes, looks at his, Okay, so God gives all sufficient grace to profitably wait for the fulfillment of what's best. Notice this idea of profitably waiting. We're going to see that in a verse a little later. Um, the waiting is for our benefit. There's stuff that's supposed to happen. And if we don't follow God's will, we're never really going to be ready. We're going to lose out on the benefit of what he has in store for us. And then if we kind of force the issue and get involved in things that aren't good for us, we will suffer pain. And you don't want to do that. It's, this guilt that, you know, even if it's joy, it's, this guilt's going to follow because it's not in God's will. And uh, grace, again, is the coin of the realm of heaven. It lets us do business in the spiritual realm. Part of that business is to wait and to wait profitably. Okay, so both marriage and singleness have advantages and disadvantages. Who knew? Yeah, it's like there's advantages to both sides. You should know what those are. Um, and then there's also responsibilities that go with each. 
And unfortunately, uh, our culture is not raising good spouses. Our schools are definitely not raising good spouses. And to a large portion, our churches don't really raise good spouses because we don't teach people to have biblical values and develop self-control. And that's a key thing for doing it, for living happily ever after. Uh, a study was done of little kids. Uh, I think they were four years old. They brought them into a lab and they put a nice big juicy marshmallow in front of them. And the guy said, you must have been a dad because you, you learn these evil things when you're dad. You could have that marshmallow now or you could wait until I get back from this errand and I'll give you a second one. So the kid's there staring at the marshmallow. The saliva is starting to drip down. The guy goes off 15 to 20 minutes. I'm not sure if he was observing them waiting until the breaking point or what he was doing. So they're being videotaped. And uh, they stare at the marshmallow, and they stare at the marshmallow. It would really be interesting to see the difference between the kids who succumbed to the desire to eat the marshmallow versus those didn't in terms of how they approached it. You know, if the guy's there staring at it, eventually you stare at something, you eat it. You know, you do what's in front of you. The other kids might have said, I'm not going to look at the marshmallow. I'm not thinking of the marshmallow. <laughs> what marshmallow? I don't see a marshmallow. You know, yeah, look at where you were except the marshmallow. But when they came back, there were some kids who had not eaten the marshmallow and they got two. Then he tracked them through college, into jobs, into marriages. And the ones who, the two marshmallow people, born with crook, um, had SAT scores that were like 120 points higher. Um, you know, it's like the chubby bunny ones, you know, <laughs> they finally got, oh. They uh, did better in school, better in college, better in mate selection, better as parents all because of that ability to not have their emotional desire rule their lives. That's what animals basically are. Instinct, do. I see, I do. God says, filter, filter God's word. You see, no, stop, don't do. Those people who have that self-control do much better than those who don't. It's been demonstrated multiple times. So we have a responsibility to control our desires whether we are married or not. One guy told me he wanted to get married to someone because he couldn't control his desires. <laughs> I said, and I said, that just goes to show you are in no condition to get married. Well, it says in 1 Corinthians, better marry than burn. Yeah, you're gonna burn, dude. Let me tell you why. And I explained how when you're married, you know, you still have to control your desires. You have to, you know, and, and your desires are constantly being tempted. And it's like, it was like an immature little kid. They never developed self-control. I mean, you know, he ate his marshmallow before the guy was out of the room. Okay, so our primary and continued responsibility as creatures on this planet, so this should apply to most of us here, is to serve and glorify God whether we're married or single. Whatever state we're in, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, <laughs> Staten Island, is that a state? No. Um, serve. The basic idea behind service, those of you who worked in a restaurant, is you wait on a person. In fact, they used to call them waiters. They waited while you said, is this thing on the menu made with green peppers or not? <laughs> is this one too spicy or not? Yeah, and they wait. And they, yeah. So yeah, your, your service person is actually a waiter. They're waiting for your order. They're, yeah, you have to decide. They don't say, you don't go into a restaurant and they throw the food at you. Okay, here it is. Oh wait, they do that in the military. Uh, they do that in some other spots, but it's like they serve, they wait. We need to basically wait on God, serve God, find out what God wants, and then give it to him. Like, what's so hard about that? God, what would you like of my life today? Wait for a response. Look at his word. What was that again? And then give it to him. You want to glorify him. It's your purpose on earth. So if you don't get a direct response, then figure out how do my activities today bring God glory. So. Before he gets to 1 Corinthians 7, there's a chapter 6. And you're supposed to, when you read these epistles, you have to know there's a context before them. And the author said, you, know, you should know this point that I just gave you in chapter 6 before you get to chapter 17. Chapter 6 has, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God? And, newsflash, you are not your own. What? <laughs> yeah. You have been bought at a price. Very expensive, Pete, by the way. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which ain't yours. They're God's. 
So people think, oh, glorifying my body, okay, I, there's certain things I don't do. I don't drink, chew, or go with girls who do. No, no, it's a, <laughs> but there's, there's also this idea of spirit, what you dwell on, what you look for, what you hope for, what you think about, what excites you. What excites you? God should excite us. The God of the universe, the creator, the one who can make anything and do anything, wants a relationship with moi. That should be an exciting thought to us. And we should try to develop a relationship with him. I'm going to see in a few minutes, the better friend you are of God, the better friend you'll be able to be with others. Uh, Jesus died for us all, or died for all, that those who live, which means they bought into his offer of forgiveness and now have eternal life, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for him and rose again. I, I love the passage in, I think it's Ephesians, it says, you guys have spent enough time doing what the pagans do. Now it's time to start doing what God wants you to do. We as Christians are supposed to be living for him, not for the gratification of our desires. One of the major reasons people go to church is to find a mate. You know, the list of reasons why, why people go to church. <laughs> so I can find something that I want. It's like, well, what about God? Maybe if you're lucky, you'll hear something about God while you're there. While we're waiting, we need to develop the character and skill set necessary for biblical relationships and biblical friendships. One little verse on this. Don't look out for your own interest, but the interest of others. So why do you want to get married? I like him. I like her. Why do you like him or her? Because they make me feel good. I want to continue this feeling. So I want to marry them. How long do you think that's going to last? I don't know, but they're wonderful. <laughs> yeah, rational thinking shut down. You just look around, look, look at how, you know, you're not happy where you are, and you're going to get married to another person who's not really happy where they are, and the two of you are going to be you know, quadruply unhappy together. Yeah, that's going to work real well. That feeling is going to go away real fast. And what happens for, for people who do not have the character and skill set necessary to enter into biblical friendships is they alienate their spouse and the spouse starts criticizing them and shows contempt for them and then they fight with each other. It's a series I did, oh, half a dozen years ago. Go look it up, it's by a guy called Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N. He's one of the first guys who uh, studied people what he called the love lab. You know, this is not something in San Francisco. This is, he brought them into a lab, he hooked up monitors to like their heart rate, their breathing rate, their sweat rate. And he had these couples just come in and talk with each other about, you know, what they liked about their relationship, what they attracted to each other, and discuss problems. And uh, then they looked for nonverbal cues, and they got so good at this that they could predict within you know, like a minute whether the marriage would last or not. And he has an amazing success rate in terms of that prediction. He also looked at some of the data. And he found out that a number of the couples were, actually the majority of the couples, hostile towards each other. And one of his premises that came out of it is criticism kills. Uh, and that's because the spouse is doing things worthy of criticism. So don't find a spouse that you're going to fix. You know, you should, what you see is what you get. No refunds, no returns. You, you, know, you, you touched it, you bought it. And you, um, but if you get a person that's looking out for their own interest and then you marry them and all they want is their own interest to look out and you're there saying, what about moi? Hello? You know, remember those vows we recited to each other? Um, it, it, those things wind up causing the couple to fight with each other, causes contempt, and that kills uh, relationships. If, on the other hand, we have learned, this is a, not a scriptural word, but I would have used the mystery word here, to have God meet our needs, meet all our needs, I learned how to write better with this one, then we're free to meet the needs of others. This is the basic principle behind biblical relationships. God meets my needs, so I'm free to meet the needs of others. So if they don't reciprocate, no biggie. Instead of getting bitter. If they um, you know, don't appreciate me as they should, eh, it's okay, God appreciates me because I did the right thing. So 
if God meets our needs, then we're free to meet the needs of the others without strings attached. If you don't have that as your relationship objective of meeting the needs of others, then you are using and the other person. And so much of what I read in contemporary uh, relationship stuff deals with, okay, so marriage counselor says, you know, so you guys are having conflict. What's the conflict over? Where do we go to eat? You know, he likes Italian, uh, I like bistro, French. And uh, the marriage counselor, charging him all kinds of dollars an hour, says, well, how about one week, one of you choose, and the next week, the other one of you choose? Well, never thought of that. <laughs> so I can only think about what I want. Yeah, it's like that actually happens, and it's one of the common things. Um, so then the other person, you know, I won't get into it. The, uh, I don't have time. Sorry, I'll do it next future weeks. We need to develop the skill set necessary for God to entrust to us one of his choice partners. So godly character is attractive. It's other-centered. It takes an interest in others. It sacrifices themselves to meet their needs. It's like Jesus. And uh, people are sometimes attracted to a godly man or woman. And they think, oh, that person would make me happy. And a question I will ask at times is, so why would God entrust this you know, choice, creation of his, to you? Why would he do that? You're not worthy of it. You know, a Stradivarius violin, gorilla. I mean, those don't, those don't go together. And you need to basically be worthy of receiving one of God's choice creations by being a choice creation. USDA choice, go for prime, it's even better. <laughs> As opposed to, ah, whatever's left over. So, I want you to be without care, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. Um, here's what an unmarried guy is supposed to do. Care for the things of the Lord about how he can please the Lord. Think about that. Gals, if you're looking for a guy, look for that. Is he caring for the things of the Lord? Is he seeking to be pleasing to the Lord? Does he understand and doing the stuff in 1 Corinthians, not Corinthians, Colossians 1, 10 and following about what pleases God? Is his major concern in life pleasing the Lord? Is he following the Great Commission? Is he basically serving as Christ served? Because the married guy cares about the things of the world, about how he may please his wife. Does she like this color rose or that color rose? Oh, I wish I had paid attention. I can't, you know, I'm gonna spend 50 bucks and bring home the wrong roses. Oh no, that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, but notice there's, you're supposed to go from caring about the Lord, caring to, about your wife. That's what's supposed to happen. Now, there's a difference between a wife and an unmarried woman. Duh, right Paul. Okay, the unmarried, we knew that. The unmarried woman cares about uh, the things of the Lord, that she may be holy in both body and spirit. So that is why a godly woman is supposed to be caring about. What does the Lord want? But she who is married cares about the things of the world as to how she may please her husband. A good marriage is made of two people who are trying to please each other and they don't give cause for offense for unsanctified character and desires. Now, Paul challenges you in 1 Corinthians 7. I encourage you to read this on your own. You might want to consider that there's more ad there might be more advantage to you for uh, being single than married. If it's God's will for marriage to happen, we'll go on to the next point. But I want to know right here, Paul says, I'm saying these things for your profit, your benefit, not to put a leash on you. Some people are into that kind of thing. Um, for, uh, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. If you look at the supplementary notes I gave when I sent out the uh, thing last week, a woman, a couple of women are there quoting, you know, if God's house is more full than in heaven, then their house here on earth, they're happy. They care about pleasing God and what's on God's agenda, not about pleasing themselves and satisfying their appetites. 
Okay, we should develop the skill set necessary. I just did that. Future husbands, future wives. I'm going to be talking about this more in the future husbands when I do Prince Charming and more about the ladies when I do uh, Sleeping Beauty. So those are two separate sermons. Before them, it's going to come Song of Solomon, Not Wake and Love Till It Pleases. So uh, you can look ahead. Future husbands should be demonstrating loving leadership as they seek to shepherd others. Um, and they should plan on meeting the needs of their spouse as an actor, go into toil, find a thing from his needs, her needs, or you can go into the sermon, marriage, feast, and famine, find out about those. Husbands are supposed to sacrifice themselves for their wives as Christ sacrificed himself for the church. Like Sanctify and cleanse, watching the word. Uh, basically, the gal, if she's being married, this is not the major point of a husband to spiritually wash his wife. It's if his wife isn't spiritually washed, she has no business really getting married. Um, husband, the point of this is husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Sacrifice yourself. You become one with your wife, so benefiting her benefits yourself. We'll talk about more when I do the Prince Charming. Future wives to demonstrate Christ-like followership. Yeah, we got this little difference. Uh, I didn't make up the, the differences between these two. God did. Um, as they seek to love others. So that's the plan. And plan on meeting needs as a star. So wives are supposed to submit and respect your husband. If, you, if the guy is not respectable, don't even consider going out with him. Um, we can talk about that more next week. And I think i got one more point down here. Yes, one more point. It is impossible for us to miss the will of God if we're seeking him with all our heart. If it's God's will, he will make it clear, he will overcome obstacles, he will do whatever it takes to bless you because that's what he's all about. If it's his will for you to be married to a particular person, it's going to happen. Don't stress. Um, now, someone said, will say, oh, well, you know, you go and look for an apartment, you go and look for jobs, uh, shouldn't you go and look for a spouse as well? There are a couple commands about not doing that, which we'll be dealing with more next week. And uh, I'll let you think about it, you can actually look at the outline. It's, it's on Song of Solomon, it's on the web, but it's going to be revised. God says to Jeremiah, um, to relate to the nation of Israel, I know the thoughts that I have for you. Uh, peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Uh, call on me, pray to me, I will listen. You'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. If you're searching for a mate for all, with all your heart, you're not going to find out what God has for you. Meantime, trust in the Lord, do good. Fall on the land, and better translation is pasture faithfulness. Uh, it's really feed, it's not feed on his faithfulness is a translation, but a better way of doing this one is uh, cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, not in your desires, and then he give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to him, trust in him, there's that trust again, and he will bring it to pass. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things get added to you. Oh, this is the one that was for next week. So, real briefly, you need to put your desire to sleep in the will of God, be a good steward of what he's entrusted to you. Don't waken up love until it's the right time. Stir up, it's a causative thing. Um, you cause it to be awake. Uh, awaken is intentional. Same word, actually, with two different Hebrew roots on it. Until it's the right timing, and that way you get to have a great relationship with the spouse. Uh, then in the meantime, you relate with your brothers and sisters in Christ, as Christ would without defrauding them. Two big commands. Don't defraud, and don't waken. These are the two biggies. Uh, for first that's four, you don't want to defraud or wrong the brother or sister, that's the web bible. Most of your versions just have brother, the original text did, but it's clearly both in the context. Um, because God called us to holiness. So I'm going to talk more about that whole stuff next week, so I don't want to have questions on that. Any questions on anything else that I said? Yeah? Um, the one about the first Corinthians 7, like the unmarried people care about being holy, pleasing the Lord. I presume married people also still care about that. <laughs> 
Um, no, it's all about finding the right <laughs> wine, roses, and chocolate. Right, I mean, right, totally. Right. It's like, <laughs> but yes. Are you trying to say that you care about your spouse more than God, or that, that people do? You, you're going to be distracted. There's a, there's a time frame. So you have this other person mm -hmm. in the mix that have you know things that you need to figure out. So he doesn't want to be distracted. Yes. Genesis happened to be in an unfallen state. Life was perfect, except for a desire for his fruit. Other than that, it was, it was, everything was good. Um, Paul, he actually goes on to say, you know, in light of the present circumstances or distresses, they're under persecution, his time was short, you know, Christ coming back from their perspective. And uh, there's, uh, it's not God's will for everyone to be married. If it was, then everyone would be married. <laughs> so the, the people who go to Genesis and say, oh, you know, God said it's not good for men to be alone, um, but then there's actual other stuff that qualifies that. Marry only in the Lord. You know, uh, it's actually a widow would be better not getting married again. There, there's other things that the same Holy Spirit wrote for life in a fallen world. So, um, there's, they, they got to read, the, it's more to the Bible than Genesis 1. But, you know, if, you, if you're a slow reader, that's as far as you got. Yes? Okay, I'll deal with that more next week. Three times in the book, he talks about love, okay? It's not just sexual love, it's an emotional love, a romantic love. There's a lot more going on there than sex. They used to deny that there was any sexuality in the book, uh, but the Hebrews wouldn't allow, the Jews wouldn't allow men to read until they were 40 and married. <laughs> um, but the, there, it, there's more to it. The actual word translated into the Septuagint is agape, which has, you know, more connotations than eros. It wasn't eros, so they, the guys 250 years before Christ understood it as, and, and just reading the context, there's a lot more that's going in there that, than, a romant, than a sexual love. Uh, romantic love is an emotional love. Um, I, one of the things I just read, and I'll bring this up again next week, is the guys who do brain scans uh, have, the term, have said that uh, love is not an emotion, it's a strong desire or a craving similar to that which people experience when they want cocaine or are anticipating losing large amounts of, I mean, winning large amounts of money. That's a different area of the brain that lights up. And I kind of made the observation to Jill, you know, both those things end badly. <laughs> I wonder if we've got this section of our brain that lights up and everything that lights it up ends badly, but. We'll talk about that more next week. So, the yeah, Song of Solomon is a, 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 it's broader than just a sexual love. And if you just think of the sense of belonging, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. You know, and they are not always together having sex; they are apart. There's a, you know, there's a, much more to the relationship. In fact, the idea of an emotional romantic relationship. Uh, it's been a while since I've read a romance novel. Actually, I've never read a romance novel. I read about what's in romance novels because I know they're popular. And they're basically not about sex. They're about romance. And that's a different thing. It's an emotional feeling where this person is going to meet all my needs and make me feel a certain way. And that feeling is not necessarily a sexual feeling. But I'll talk about that next week when we do more Song of Solomon. Any other questions? Who here? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, let me, let's take a look at number five because I'm going to cover this again, but uh, this frequently. When can seeking for or shopping for a spouse be in conflict with God's perfect will for us? When we do it outside the will of God. When we do it in such a way that we defraud others, promise things we can't deliver, take advantage of them. Or when we waken a romantic emotional bond that is not meant to be shared outside a marriage relationship. 
So this is a fire, people. This causes lots of people to go up in flames. So uh, we're down in flames. It's something to be very, very careful on. We're waiting for the food. How does living with roommate number four prepare you now living for a spouse in the future? Yeah. So is it ever a time, is God's will for you to search for a spouse? Is God what? Is it ever a time, is it his will for you to search for a spouse? Because if it's his plan, then he will, he will make it happen. Right, right the, the, the peace, I don't know if I have it in here. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually right above this. Um, you can't determine his subjective will without doing his objective will, okay? So if you're doing his objective will, you, you get a sense of how God works, what he wants, and he will guide you towards the next steps. And it's gonna be done in accord with his will. And those around you will know that it's in accord with his will. You know, the steps you're taking, people say, yeah, it's in accord with your will. You'll have a conviction that this is God's will and here's why. You know, the, the key question to be asking about any major decisions, and you know, who you marry is probably the biggest decision you ever make because of its long-term consequences for good or evil, um, is how do you know it's God's will? If a person does not have a daily relationship with God, where God guides them with his eye upon them, then they're kind of just, you know, down at the pond kissing frogs, hoping one of them will kiss back. You know, it's, it's not uh, a good way to go. When it's God's will, it becomes obvious. And if it's not God's will, then that also should be obvious. But the trouble is, when the emotions kick in, the, there's a link between our emotions and the part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, that makes rational decisions. It gets shut down. They've actually shown this. They show a woman a picture of uh, her lover or her baby, and the part of the brain that makes rational decisions goes dark. It's like, <laughs> Rational thinking goes out the window. It's like, we're wired that way. It's kind of crazy. Um, but that's kind of what happens. So it's, you know, you've heard people say, oh, I want a you know, guy who loves Jesus more than he loves me. And then you meet some guy that they like. Oh yeah, he loves Jesus a whole lot more than, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, you can't even spell Jesus. And you know, <laughs> it's like you're saying, this is the thing that you, you know. It's, the rationality is bye-bye because the emotions got wakened before it was time. I'll probably use that concept again next week. The, you know, the God has designed life to work well when we do it his way. Follow-up? Yeah. Um, is it any different for the guys and the girls? Because the girls obviously respond, the guys take the lead, so. Um, when the girls respond, guys take the lead. Actually, I would dispute that. Um, when you get to wink to wedding, I'll bring that up a little bit more. Okay. Believe it or not, Guys are not as, we're not as stupid as we look and act, although we would give people lots of evidence for that. <laughs> um, but gals actually send out signals that they're interested, which causes the guy to, you know, unless you have a total idiot who just goes through every, everyone he meets, will you marry me, will you marry me? Yeah, it's, <laughs> and like, n nobody's gonna want that. But actually, <laughs> uh, most relationships and the people who study this like on a micro level, We'll say the gal sends out signals, the guy responds, and she is basically saying, yeah, this might work. And then the guy says, oh, I, I, I don't think she's gonna chop my head off if I ask her for a date. And then the, the relationships progress. But that's on the wink to wedding one. That comes at the end. I don't wanna, get, don't practice this anywhere until, you know, just wait three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you don't wanna to untangle messes. But, uh, you know, the guy, uh, can be convinced by God that that's something that uh, pursuing a relationship is something that uh, God wants him to do. And he usually doesn't take the gal by surprise. But uh, we'll talk about that more in the week to wedding. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that marriage is your idea, as is singleness. Um, we thank you that regardless of the condition that we're in, our goal is to serve you and please you by doing your will. Thank you that your will can be known. Um, the will is always in our best interest. And regardless of whether it's uh, for being single or married, you will give us grace that we need to uh, serve you as you desired and intended when you put us together. 
Um, I pray that you would uh, enable us to share truth like this with our culture that is wandering around in darkness, um, that we can protect them from uh, stupid mistakes and harm emotionally, and you would guide um, us in our relationships so that we live in a manner that is pleasing to you. Thanks for our food. We commit ourselves to this task of being lights for your glory's sake. In Christ's name, amen.